All right, welcome to the Ultrasound Lecture Series today. Um, I'm pretty excited for today for a couple of reasons. We're going to dive into some advanced topics today, which I kind of enjoy looking into and reading and presenting and, and uh, putting together. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. Number two, we're going to try something a little bit new in that we are going to do a little bit of a whiteboard style. So I have right here some paper that we are going to utilize later on in the lecture where we can just kind of talk about stuff. So this will be kind of a little, a little bit of a hybrid. We're gonna talk, have some pictures to show, right? We got some paper to talk with, uh, be a little bit more of conversational style. But in the process of all this, we are going to learn a little bit more about some advanced spectral Doppler. And really the point of this, the goal of this is to kind of prep ourselves for some conversations that we're going to have coming up later on in the year, um, where we're just going to talk a little bit more about some Doppler applications in cardiac ultrasound. So this is going to be laying the groundwork, talking a little bit about, you know, what is spectral Doppler? How do we do it? Well, maybe not so much how we do it, but like, what are the different types of spectral Doppler? What do the different packets mean? Kind of how do we interpret the different variables that spectral Doppler kind of brings to play uh, in the course of our, our ultrasounding of patients? So with that said, let's dive on in. Let's roll it with this and let's learn some ultrasound and do some of the spectral Doppler. So first off, I have no disclosures to make. Got to tell you about it. But I don't have any. So if you uh, if you have anything, we can talk later. Um, but yeah, we're going to keep rolling with that today. So first order of business is we're going to talk a little bit about an overview of Doppler ultrasound, right? Uh, so what is Doppler ultrasound? What is spectral Doppler? And that's going to help us kind of set the stage for kind of what we're going to do later. So if you think about it, we do 2D ultrasound, right? All the time. We're looking at um, the image. We're looking at, you know, that, that picture that represents what's going on inside the body. Um, and we can manipulate that image in different ways. We've talked about like depth and gain and focus and all these different ways to make that 2D image look a little bit better. Uh, but one thing we can utilize is since this is, this is sound and there's this principle called the Doppler principle whereby objects that are moving can modulate the pitch or whatever sound is being um, you know, emanated from that object or reflected from that object, you can modulate that that pitch or that frequency. And since we know the frequency we transmitted and then the frequency receiving back, we can interpret that data as to saying, hey, you know what? That object must then be moving towards or away from our transducer, right? And so we utilize this all the time as an overlay on top of that 2D image, right? And so we can say that Doppler, whether it be color Doppler or spectral Doppler, is a graphical display. And here I wrote graphical color display, but you can also put in graphical spectral display, right? Um, superimposed on that 2D image resulting from frequency changes caused by movement of fluids uh, or tissues, right? And so you can do fluid, like you can do Doppler of the blood vessels, you can do Doppler of tissues, and all of these are different ways of quantifying or calculating or showing the movement of whatever that is that you're looking at, whether it be the fluid or the tissue or, or whatever, right? So that's Doppler ultrasound. If you want to put a picture on it to kind of get that view, right? Here's an example of the 2D image kind of in the top of the screen with that, that color overlay. So you can see the flow through the valve there. And then the bottom portion is the spectral display where it's showing the movement of the, the fluid in this situation, the blood that is being interrogated underneath the caliper that's identified on the screen, right? Um, and so it's a great way for us to see that fluid inside that, you know, that chamber from the, or the, the transition from the mitral valve to, or um, the, um, the atria to the ventricle, excuse me, on the left side. And we can, can really represent that, that fluid movement, either color with the color or with the graphical display, right? And so when we do this, right, science is the art of the reproducible, right? So there's art to science, right? There's definitely some um, some variability that we've kind of gotten to custom to in medicine, but there's also some reproducibility to it. Um, and so we want to maximize the reproducibility so that I can scan and then you can come along later and scan the same patient and really get some of the same and similar findings that we've seen on this patient, right? So we're going to have a few conventions that we're going to establish here. And one is on this spectral display, right, our horizontal axis or our x-axis is going to be time, right? So you, on the left, you have your time zero. And on the right, you have your time, whatever your, your scale is set to, like however compressed that time scale is. Uh, but it's going to be time, right? It's going to be time moving forward. 
on the vertical axis or your Y axis, you're going to have velocity, right? So it's going to show the velocity of the blood that it interrogates um, on that Y axis. And it can plot that. And since we are talking about pulsatile things like blood that moves in a very pulsatile manner, we're going to get these spikes and troughs and spikes and troughs um, as we show that blood migrating through the heart, right? And, and really um, triggering this Doppler phenomenon um, that's going to be displayed on the screen here, right? So uh, by convention, things moving toward the transducer are going to be above the baseline and things moving away from the transducer are going to be below the baseline, right? Now there's buttons on the machine where you can invert that, but if you just do a hard reset to factory settings, right? It's going to be convention above the baseline is toward the transducer and below the baseline is away from the transducer. So what we may see in this example is, you know, especially when you have heart or blood that's flowing into a ventricle and out of the ventricle, it's going to flow in like, well, I just said it, it's going to flow in and it's going to flow out. And so you should see a Doppler packet that goes toward the transducer or above the baseline. And you see a Doppler packet that goes away from the transducer or below the baseline, right? It doesn't really have anything to do with where specifically that blood flow is happening. It's just telling you that when in the area that's being interrogated is blood flowing toward the transducer or away from the transducer, right? And then you've got to check your, your scale, right? So some scales will be in centimeters per second. Some scales will be in meters per second. Um, so you can kind of get a, an idea um, of the rough velocity that this, this blood is traveling uh, throughout the, the chamber that you're interrogating. Uh, and we can actually put some numbers on that and calculate that. And we'll see that later on in the course of, of today's discussion that we can put some really some, put some helpful numbers around these these waveforms that we're seeing and get some useful clinical data, right? So that's the convention. That's kind of the baseline, how we do this, how we make it reproducible. Uh, we want, One other thing we got to talk about before we go into kind of what do these packets mean is the two different types of spectral Doppler, right? So we see uh, in this, we see uh, there's two types. So there's pulse wave Doppler and there's continuous wave Doppler, right? And so pulse wave Doppler is exactly what the you know, what the name would imply. It's, a, it's got a pulse to it. Whereas continuous wave Doppler is it's, it's you know, basically continuous. Um, and as I switch over here, we're going to basically just illustrate that and say, when you have your window, right, we're going to have this Doppler caliper here, and this is pulse wave. So basically what we're saying is I want to interrogate through this line, specifically between this gate, right? And so you can put whatever structure you want in there and you can kind of move the gate around. And so the probe, right? So you have your probe here. It's going to send these pulses of sound out. So it's going to send the sound and then it's going to wait a period of time before it sends out the next peak. And in this intervening period of time, it's going to listen and it's going to display back what it's hearing basically in terms of the Doppler shift. So if it sends it out at frequency X, but hears it back at frequency X plus some number, right? It's going to display that as the Doppler signal, right? Um, and then it will kind of repeat between pulses. The advantage that we have here is that I can tell you what's happening beneath this caliper, right? By, by setting this, say, setting that pulse, I can say I'm listening for a specific spot that's between this caliper and this caliper. And so whatever velocity that I give you, right? So we have our velocity and our time, whatever Doppler packet that I give you is happening right here, right? Contrast that with continuous wave Doppler. So we're going to go like, or show our, our ultrasound here, and we're going to have our continuous wave beam. And it's usually denoted by like a diamond here, right? Um, but what's happening here is part of that transducer, right? So here's our transducer, part of it's sending and part of it's receiving, right? Continuously. And so it's going to have this continuous send and receive, um, you know, coming out of the out of the transducer, and what that gives me is basically it's going to give me in my velocity time axis here. It's going to give me a similar looking spike. Okay, what I lose is since I'm constantly sending and I'm constantly receiving, I can't tell you where along this Doppler line that spike is happening. I can tell you that somewhere along here but I can't tell you exactly where based on the machine. You can make some clinical presumptions if you're looking through a valve, it's probably through there, um, but it's gonna give me a very um, kind of very shaded in, we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, uh, Doppler packet here that's gonna happen somewhere along this line, right? 
So I lose a little bit of specificity in terms of where specifically it's happening. But what I gain is the fact that I can really interrogate fast flowing things. So moving back to the pulse wave Doppler for a minute, because I'm sending out a pulse, right? Whatever I receive back has to be received back within this particular time window, right? Between point A and point B, which means there's a limit <clears throat> to how fast the structures I can, I can interrogate, right? Because there's a limit to how many pulses that I can put in to, to get faster structures. I have to add pulses, right? So there's a limited amount of time where I can send a pulse and listen back, pulse and listen back. So the V max that I'm going to be able to interrogate with pulse wave Doppler is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 to 1.7 meters per second. Okay. It becomes really important uh, because some things, particular pathologic valves are going to exceed this velocity range. Whereas with continuous wave Doppler, since I'm constantly sending and constantly receiving, I can increase the received value, or I can, I can expect to receive faster velocities, or I can and resolve those faster velocities, because it really doesn't matter how frequently I'm sending the pulses, right? I'm sending them as fast as I can send them. So I can, I can resolve that faster flow. But what I can't tell you is I can't tell you where that is, because I, I'm not sending pulses, essentially, it's continuous continuously sending Doppler. So that's the two different forms of Doppler that we're looking at. Um, if we go back to here, we're going to see some differences. So on the left, we see the pulse wave Doppler, right? And you can see kind of that very, um, very clean uh, line denoting flow through the mitral valve there. You can see the, the bimodal peaks. And then the right, you see the continuous wave Doppler, which looks a little bit more shaded in, um, but it's going to give us the opportunity to give us faster flow um, through that line that we're going to look at, right? So that's Doppler uh, in a nutshell. Let's talk a little bit about packet information. And by packet, I'm going to talk about whatever that waveform that we look at, you know, that individual beat waveform Doppler image, right? That I'm going to define as the packet. So let's talk about what packet information we're receiving um, and what, you know, that packet can then tell you, right? And so when we look at this, we want, there, there's some very interesting things that we can pull out of this particular waveform that's going to help us clinically, whether, you know, it'd be adding some numbers or some, you know, characteristics of this waveform. And if we, to, to do that, I want to back up just a little bit. Okay. Um, I want us to actually think about that in the context of something else, right? Something that we maybe can understand a little bit better. And that is a car, right? Or more specifically traffic, right? And if you think about it, we got a bunch of blood cells going through a vessel or through a chamber of the heart. Traffic is a bunch of cars going through a road um, or a blood vessel or however you want to, to look at it, right? Um, so we're going to kind of describe things from a car analogy, because um, I think that's helpful in terms of understanding what this information is that we're that we're looking at, right? So think about a single car, right? So you're driving a car, right? I drive a truck, right? I like trucks. Uh, so that's why I use trucks. This is my lecture, I get to do what I want. Um, so we're taking a truck here. Um, and if you had a radar gun, right, you could measure the acceleration of that truck and plot it out over time, right? And so that's essentially what we're doing, saying, we're gonna say, we're gonna stop, right? And you say, one, two, three, go, right? I'm gonna hit the acceleration um, or hit the gas. And you're gonna measure how fast I can accelerate my truck. And it's basically gonna look like this graph. And I found this graph on Google, um, you know, just a graph of acceleration, right? There's nothing fancy. You have your velocity on your vertical axis. You have your time on your horizontal axis. And basically saying at time zero, we're gonna be a speed of zero. Um, and then at subsequent time intervals, we're going to have an increase uh, in our speed. And remember, um, you know, when you talk about physics, you talk about not only the, the, the actual speed, the miles per hour, but you also can talk about your acceleration. Uh, so if we go back to, you know, our graph here, right? We, remember, you can have your, excel, your time here. So this is, you can get from this data point, your speed. So your velocity one, you can get from this one, your velocity two, but you can also get this acceleration, the, the angle, right, uh, of acceleration. So how rapidly you go from velocity to one to velocity two, and all that in reference to how long it takes. And so this is very similar, uh, and should look very familiar when it comes to, um, you know, our, our Doppler information, it's really the same type of thing. Okay, now the difference, um, particularly in our context, where we're dealing with pulsatile things, right, I, we don't really have a continuous rotor, um, 
in our body. I remember when I was in med school, one of the profs was like, yeah, it'd be really convenient if the lungs were like this continuous rotor where you just didn't have pulses, you could just kind of move things through. And I guess, I mean, I guess you could say we do when you have like an LVAD, you know, um, there's like a continuous flow of blood, uh, which is actually very disconcerting, if, you know, um, you know, to evaluate. But anyway, that being said, like we have pulsatile flow. And so our body is going to be more like or more analogous to evaluating a car as it goes from one stoplight to the next, right? So we're going to just presume, or for the sake of this analogy, just assume, hey, we're stopped at a stoplight, right? And then there's a block, a city block, X many feet, whatever, uh, fixed amount of time. And we're going to stop at the next one. So the light goes green at light A, right? You accelerate your vehicle, in this case, my truck, from light A to light B, right? And then you're going to stop at light B, right? And then, and this is a really inefficient city, right? Ultrasoundopolis or whatever we want to call the, you know, Sanoville, right? Whatever we want to call this city. Um, we are going to, it's very inefficient and the lights aren't timed, right? So that you stop at every single light. I guess I put a, should have put a stop sign in, but whatever, there are stoplights here. So what you're going to have is a velocity time curve that looks very similar to this arc, right? Um, where the, the vehicle accelerates to a maximum speed somewhere in the middle of the block, and then they hit the brake, right? I, I'm driving, I hit the brake so that I can decelerate and be stopped by the time I hit the next stoplight, right? And so you have this very smooth arc uh, as I accelerate and decelerate through that intersection or through that, that section of road till I get to the next intersection. Now, what happens, right? If so, so at two in the morning when I'm driving home from work, right? Um, it's just me on the road, right? So this is what it looks like. What happens if it's two in the afternoon and I'm driving to or from work and there's just, there's me and a lot of other people on the road, right? So we're all going to stop and start at relatively the same time and rate, right? Presuming that, um, you know, the lights turn green and then they turn red, right? And they just got to go and alternate between the, at, at your two intersections. So there's going to be a column of vehicles, right? That move through that block that accelerate at roughly the same rate, right? And decelerate at roughly the same rate, okay? Now there's going to be some minor differences because you may be driving in the lane next to me and I may say, I'm going to hurry to get to work. So I'm going to gun it, right? But really I can't get going too terribly fast you know, because I know I have to stop. So I might accelerate out a little faster and you may catch up to me, right? And then, you know, our deceleration times will be a little bit different. So all that to say, because there's multiple vehicles involved, we're going to have a broadened spectrum compared to what we had before, where we have kind of this wider range of velocities, right? So they're all about the same. They're all pretty similar, but there's a wider range of velocities as you accelerate through that that city, city block, uh, giving us kind of this broad, you know, stroke broad stroke of velocities kind of going through the arc right now there may be a couple little stragglers in here so if i go back to um back to here right so we have let's see if i can get myself focused um there we go um so if we are on our city street right so we have the city street here and there's a tree whatever there's a car pretty bad artist that's why i'm a doctor right let's say there's a bicyclist right and someone who's walking, they need all of them, right? These things are gonna have different velocities than the car, right? They're slightly lower velocities. So as we look at this velocity time scale, you're gonna have this broadened spectrum of velocities here like this. And these guys will show up as these little, you know, things in the middle, right? So what we're saying, all that really to say is presume that every, car gives you a little blip on this scale, right? You're going to have some that are going to be lower speed. You're going to have some that are be higher speed. Some are going to be stragglers kind of somewhere in the middle, right? And that's what we're going to get when we go back to our ultrasound image, where we can see this packet of information is all those blood vessels that are moving through that area of interrogation over time, right? And so what we see here above the baseline is flow into the left ventricle and below the baseline is we see flow out of the left ventricle. So we're looking really at the aortic outflow area, right? Or the aortic, aortic outflow space. Um, I'll use a different word than area because that has different meanings later today. Uh, so this aortic outflow space, 
Um, and so you get a little bit of that residual like flow in, which is that spike above, and, but you were really looking for that flow out, right? That aortic flow out uh, as we're leaving the, the, the left ventricle is that, that below the baseline spike, right? So that's kind of roughly what we're looking at kind of when we're talking about what is a packet and what does that packet mean? Um, so the next thing that we want to talk about, and really we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, before we kind of open it up and, and talk about this, is what does this packet tell us, right? Let's dive into kind of for, for lack of a better um, cheesy phrase, uh, the anatomy of a packet, right? What is this packet giving us, right? And we can look at this in a few different ways. Um, the first one that I want to really go through is what is the overall morphology of the packet? Right. So what is just the shape? Right. Is it a rectangle, triangle, square, circle, oval, parallelogram? Like my kids are in school and they're learning these things right now, um, you know, the different shapes. And while it may not be the exact list that we just you know talked about, different valves, different vessels, different pathologies within those valves and vessels will create different potentially characteristic shapes in the way that those you know, blood, the blood cells are moving through that area, or to kind of borrow for analogy, the vehicle in the way that the car is moving through the street, right? So here's an example. Um, and again, I'm not going to get into all the details of specific pathologies, more or less just to bring them up and highlight it to say this is kind of, you know, what spectral Doppler can be used to, to show, right? But here's an example of some stenotic flow through an aortic valve, right? So in one situation, we have just aortic valvular stenosis. That's the yellow one on the bottom. And on the upper one, we have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, right? And so one of the things that can happen, right, if we go back to our analogy of the road. Um, so if we go back to here, right, if you have your road, and they're doing construction on my road uh, at home right now, right? Um, so if you have a vehicle, that's traveling down the road at a certain velocity, right? Uh, and you measure it, let's say we're gonna measure it right here, right? You're gonna get a characteristic waveform, right? Of that velocity of the car as it's accelerating through that area, right? Now, what if I take the same road, right? I'm measuring it here, but I put a big old cone in the road, right? They're working on this road. So we have these big warning signs, um, the cones that say there's a construction coming up here, right? And I measure the velocity of the vehicle, right? As it goes around the cones and then down this road, it's going to look a lot different than just a clear unobstructed road, right? Now to further kind of add to the analogy, what if I measure it upstream from that cone? So we're going to assume that the road moves here, right? We're going to put the cone here, right? And I'm still measuring here. What is the velocity of this vehicle as it comes up to and approaches that cone and goes around it. And we have to think about this in the context of not just one car, but multiple cars. What happened, right? You're going to have some convergence. Like here, you're going to have smooth laminar flow. Here, you're going to have the convergence of the cars, right? And here, you're going to have like this slow acceleration through the, the cone space. And then they kind of speed back up after you get past the cone, right? We all know this because we get stuck in traffic all the time, right? And so there's that big convergence of cars before the obstruction, kind of the narrow flow through the construction. And then there's that um, divergence of the, the vehicles after the construction, right? And so that's what we have here with the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. There is a slow acceleration, giving that characteristic dagger-like you know, waves uh, for the, the, the velocity or the Doppler complex. Whereas just general aortic stenosis is gonna be a high velocity packet uh, that's moving through that area as opposed to the normal velocity packets. Um, so these are a couple of images that I pulled off of, um, you know, some articles and some helpful resources uh, earlier, uh, but it just shows that you ha may have the ultimate same velocity, right? You may have high velocity through that stenotic area, but based on where that obstruction is relative to where you're looking, it may look different and that morphology may be different, right? The other example that we can bring up is looking, uh, doing diastolic dysfunction. So uh, remember back from last year, um, Z from the MICU gave us some, a great lecture on diastolic dysfunction. If you wanna go back and look at it, um, go back, we have it on the YouTube channel um, and check it out. It's a really good lecture. Um, 
But basically what we're looking at here is the flow through the mitral valve, right? So we have the early filling, the E wave, that's the first peak in that bimodal peak there. And then the A wave is the atrial kick uh, of just kind of the atrium just topping off the rest of the fluid in the, in the ventricle. That's the A wave, right? And based on the morphology of these waves and, um, you know, and the morphology of the tissue do Doppler, you know, that would be evaluated as well, we can really put this on a spectrum from, you know, no diastolic dysfunction to severe diastolic dysfunction, you know, based on, you know, is E bigger than A, is A bigger than E, how big, how big is that relative difference? So that morphology without even getting into some calculations can really have a profound effect on, or, or the, the pathology can have a profound effect on the morphology, um, even before we get into some calculations, if that makes sense, right? So that's the first thing um, that spectral Doppler can do for us and kind of the first thing that can help help us understand. The next thing is, some, is this phenomenon called spectral broadening, right? Uh, so as we talked about uh, with our previous analogy, um, so if I bring it back here, um, so in our previous analogy, we talked about this normal road, right? We talked about the laminar flow that happens on this road. And so when we talk about blood vessels, right? Um, so here's our blood vessel, and you're going to have a column of blood moving through there, and you're going to have a various ranges of velocities kind of in this column of blood, right? And the ones towards the periphery are going to tend to be a touch slower than the ones towards the center. And we can denote that by larger uh, Vs here. Um, and they get smaller uh, as it goes towards the, the periphery, because there's going to be a little bit more resistance along the periphery here. Um, but for the most part, in a pulse cycle, most blood vessels are going to travel within a, a small range of velocities. You know, so you'll have like your center velocity, and then it'll be like minus one and plus one, whatever those one units are, right? Uh, and that's going to be pretty decent laminar flow, right? And it's going to, when we put that on, I'm going to change papers to get rid of some of the distracting elements here. When we put that on a graph, right, we're going to see velocity, time, and we're going to see kind of that velocity range follow this arc, right? And we'll have a couple of these different, you know, the slower ones, the faster ones, but they're all going to be in this relative arc, right? So there's not going to be a lot of blood vessels at time, whatever. So this is beat one, beat two. So like your QRS complex here, QRS complex there, right? There's not going to be a lot of, you know, blood vessels or blood, not blood vessels, blood cells um, in this diastolic, like mid diastolic range or period that's going to have a velocity down here, let's say, right? Because everything's relatively going the same velocity. Now, throw in some pathology to that, right? So let's say we have a blood vessel here that's gotten some obstruction, right? We got some plaque or something like that in this blood vessel. Or using the car example, we got cones in the roadway. What's going to happen? We're going to have this blood vessel with certain velocity. This one has got to hit that obstruction and find a way around it. And then this one's going to come, find a way around and get kind of stuck in this whirlpool and then keep going, right, uh, down here. And so we're going to have a much broader range of velocity. So our center velocity is here. And now it may be plus or minus, oops, not a plus there, minus three, plus three to kind of hit that broad range, right? And so our picture is going to look very different. So we have our velocity time. Here's our center range, right? And we may have like a higher one here and a lower one here. And what we have now is what we call spectral broadening, right? Um, so as we add things that are going to slow other blood vessels down, we broaden the spectrum and we lose what's what this thing here is called the spectral window, right? Spectral window. Um, and that's that blank area inside or underneath that, that Doppler curve. Um, and so we see this, you know, you can see this when you have turbulent flow. Um, we're obviously going to see this when you have like continuous wave Doppler, right? Because remember, we're look, evaluating all the velocities. So uh, for continuous wave Doppler, here's our ventricle, right? Um, there's the outflow track, right? There's our left ventricle. Here's our atrium here. If we're evaluating through here, we're going to get every velocity from here all the way down through here, right? So I'll get the fastest stuff here, but I'm evaluating that slow stuff there. So I'm going to broaden out that spectral window here, okay? And then you can also have this phenomenon in low resistance circuits where you know blood flow is just kind of 
slow and sluggish, right? Um, and this is when you have end organs, you know, or like end organ, you know, vessels, where you want to have that slow flow to give plenty of time for diffusion of oxygen, oxygen um, waste and nutrients uh, into that air, into that structure. And so if we go back to our image here, we can basically see on the top, you have a high resistance circuit, right? You can see that spectral window inside there. So most of the velocities, I mean, this is like cars on a highway. Most every car on the highway is going somewhere between like 65 and 75, right? To be perfectly honest. Um, whereas in the, the low or the, uh, the bottom spectrum here, this is going to be a low resistance circuit, right? This is going to be an end organ circuit. Um, and so there's going to be you know, like a local street, you have cars going kind of the speed limit, you got some like person who's learning how to drive and super, you know, scared and driving slow. Um, someone who uh, probably shouldn't be driving and driving super slow, you have someone on a bicycle who's like speeding by someone who's riding lazily on a bicycle, someone who's walking. So like a whole range of velocities, kind of in this, this packet that we're looking at. And so you're just displaying them all uh, and you lose that, that spectral window uh, and you have that spectral broadening. So we're going to see that principle from time to time um, as we interrogate these Doppler packets. Um, the next thing that is really helpful is starting to put some numbers on these Doppler packets that we get. So V max or velocity max is one that's really helpful, right? You can take, you can take this packet, right? In this situation, we're looking at you know, blood flow through, I think it's the aortic outflow track. Um, and we're putting some numbers on that. And we're saying the maximum speed, the fastest car out there on the road, right? And this is what the police do when they're on the road. The fastest car out there, the fastest blood vessel or blood, blood cell out there is going at this speed, right? So if we go back to our drawing board here, we can say on this roadway, right? So we're driving on the road. Here comes a vehicle, right? There's other vehicles on the road, right? The policeman sitting over here, and if you haven't talked to Z about his analogy about challenging the uh, challenging the police officer about the speed on the radar based on the the delta or the the you know the theta the the different angle there, talk to Z about that because it's rather amusing. Uh, but he's measuring all these different cars as they go through this narrow window here, and he's plotting all of them out velocity over time as this you know arc of cars right and he doesn't care about this one he doesn't care about this one he doesn't care about this one he cares about this one car who's going super duper fast right and so that's going to be this car at the tip of the peak there um, and so what we can do is we can put a caliper on this we can put our measurement tool on and measure this distance right uh, and the machine will interpret that and basically say okay here's my velocity scale if i'm measuring setting a point here my velocity max is x, whatever that number happens to be. So in our example here, the velocity max is 100, or, I mean, it's technically 106, but we're going to say 100 centimeters per second uh, for the sake of this calculation to make it easy, right? I don't want to calculate 106 in my head. Um, so 100 centimeters per second, we're going to convert it to just standard units, which would be meters per second, equals about one meter per second, right? So that, that fastest blood cell is going one meter per second in this interrogation, right? And where this becomes really helpful, and you can say, okay, great, Matt, um, wonderful, a blood cell is going a meter a second. What does it mean to me? Like, I, I, don't, I don't have a vital, like I have vital signs that are in like heart rate, my heart rate my respiratory rate, my SATs, I have a blood pressure, but I don't have like a vital sign that's, you know, blood flow through an aortic valve in meters per second, right? It's just not part of my data that I'm really interested in right now. But what we can do is we can calculate and we can use this number to come up with a pressure gradient, right? And that becomes really, really helpful um, as we calculate a few different things. So there's this thing called the Bernoulli equation, right? And it's a way of converting pressure gradients to, um, to velocity gradients and vice versa, right? And there's a lot of like every equation, there's, you know, the main meat and potatoes of the equation, plus a whole bunch of like nuanced, you know, things, you know, that you have to account for, right? Um, for the most part, a lot of these things can be held constant or be de determined to be insignificant. So it leaves us with that main core of the equation, right? And so for the modified Bernoulli equation, right, we're going to have basically the core of it is the delta P, 
or the change in pressure is equal to four times the change in velocity. I messed that up. Delta P equals four times the change in velocity squared. Right? So we had our velocity. That was, remember, that was one meter per second as we interrogate it through whatever thing we're interrogating. The situation that we had on the screen, uh, it was through the aortic valve, right? So I can plug this number into this equation and get delta P equals four times one squared. Well, one squared is one times four equals four millimeters of mercury, right? And if we go back to our image, you can see on the um, on the display there, it's giving us a pressure gradient of four millimeters of mercury or 4.46 millimeters of mercury, right? Now, what that doesn't necessarily mean is the pressure there is four millimeters of mercury. It means that the delta P or that change in pressure is, four, is a change of four millimeters of mercury. And here's where this becomes interesting and important, right? We've, we've done this before and we can, um, we, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do it again, right? Uh, but if you go back and look at some of the pulmonary hypertension videos that we've you know, posted here, we've talked about using this principle to calculate the pulmonary artery pressure, or at least the systolic pulmonary artery pressure, right? So if you think about it, okay, we have our left ventricle, our, my, our left atrium, right? We'll put a little muscle around that. And then we have the right ventricle, right? And the right atrium, we have our appropriate and corresponding valves, right? So if I want to know what's, and I know the pulmonary you know, valve is somewhere buried in the middle of this, but let's just say, it, or let's just say pulmonary artery here, just coming off the side, right? Just for the sake of the picture. Uh, so if I want to know the pressure here, so the SPAP, if I want to know that, I can use this Bernoulli equation. Remember, it was delta P equals four times delta V squared, right? So my pressure here is going to be comprised of a couple things, right? It's going to be comprised of my preload plus whatever pressure gradient with systole I can generate, right? Whatever systolic pressure difference I can generate. Well, this happens to be delta P, right? And then my preload is going to be my right atrial pressure. Right atrial pressure plus delta P gives me my systolic pulmonary artery pressure, right? So I've got everything that I need to be able to calculate this, right? So what we're going to do is we want to find the difference, the pressure gradient uh, between the atria and the ventricle, right? Because that's going to be whatever, um, you know, whatever pressure we can generate with our, our systole, right? And the best way we can measure that is with a tricuspid regurge jet, right? So here in the tricuspid regurge jet, we're squeezing the right ventricle. We're a little bit that's leaking back through uh, into the right atrium. And we can kind of measure that pressure change that happens, right? Or the velocity change that happens uh, to kind of get a little peek into that right ventricle to see what's going on, right? So if I get my Doppler packet and it's going to be going down or uh, away from the probe. So it's going to go down. So I'm going to get some packet that looks like this, right? Um, it, and that's going to be my, my, my tri or tricuspid regurge jet, right? So we have velocity time, right? If I measure this peak velocity here, right? So my V max of that tricuspid regurge jet, I can plug that into the Bernoulli equation, right? And say my V max here squared in, in meters per second times four gives me whatever my delta P is here. And I don't happen to have numbers uh, right here to throw in, but it works, right? We've done this actually at the bedside uh, in the unit, right? With Z when we've been scanning with him. And so that will give me my delta pressure gradient, right? My pressure gradient between the right ventricle and the right atrium during systole. Now I need to add that to my preload, my preloading conditions. And you can pull this up from a table. And it's basically, you look at your IVC and you make some, you know, you categorize based on the size and collapsibility of the IVC. But let's just say for the sake of example, my right atrial pressure is five millimeters of mercury, right? Um, go back and watch that video. You can figure out how to get to that. You add in 
your pulmonary artery pressure. And let's say it calculates itself out to be, let's say 40 millimeters of mercury, right? That then the combination gives you a systolic pulmonary artery pressure of 45 millimeters of mercury, right? And that's how, that's how we can use that information. And so for the, the example that we did earlier, you know, last year when we were scanning with Z, we were able to take the, the velocity of the tricuspid reurge jet, run it through the calculation, get a, a number. And this particular patient happened to have a right heart cath done, and they happened to have the transducer plugged into the monitor. And we were able to look up at the monitor and say, we calculated it at 90 some odd millimeters of mercury. And the monitor shows 90 some odd millimeters of mercury, and they're pretty close to spot on, right? So it's an easy and non-invasive way to start getting some of these delta pressures um, you know, and using that information to provide uh, some some clinical insight into your patient. In this situation, some pulmonary artery, you know, hypertension uh, for that particular patient. So that's the, the VMAX. That's how that can, can be used. The next one that can be helpful is something called the acceleration time, right? And if you think about that, it's really exactly what it says. How long does it take for a car to accelerate from stopped or from whatever point to it's max, right? So as we're, as we're, um, you know, looking at the car analogy, right? I started driving at the stoplight. I accelerated, then I decelerated. How long to take from zero to sixty, you know, miles an hour, or whatever that that V max was, and that's our acceleration time. And so in this example, you can basically set a caliper at the beginning of the waveform and at the end of the waveform, or the end of the packet, or the the V max area of the packet, the, the peak velocity, and that gives you that amount of time. And where it's helpful is there's kind of an expected range of, of velocity acceleration times that you would have in different vessels, right? And so you've probably heard of the 60-60 sign, um, probably heard of it because I think we've talked about it in this forum before. Uh, but basically it says that if you have a pulmonary artery systolic pressure of less than 60 millimeters of mercury, we just talked about how to get that, okay? and your pulmonary artery acceleration time is less than 60 milliseconds, that combination has a high probability that your patient's gonna end up having a pulmonary embolism, right? It's very, it's, it's very good and very accurate for PE. Um, so where this becomes important, right, is here's our pulmonary artery acceleration time. We're measuring the flow into the pulmonary artery. So if you think about it, you have your heart, pardon just the cheesy example here, you have your conduit to the lungs, right? And if you put a blockage in there somewhere, right, you're not going to be able to get flow as easily past that blockage, right? Um, and it's going to increase some pressures, right? And so if you think about what would happen with different obstructions, I don't, that road has an end. I don't want that road to have an end, right? But if we put an obstruction in the road here, right, and your car has to drive around that obstruction, right? You're gonna have some interesting acceleration profiles when you look here, here, and here, right? And based on your acceleration profile, you might be able to say where a blockage occurs, right? And so um, you can use this in this situation of the pulmonary embolism to really say, this is where my obstruction, or I have an obstruction in this normal flow, right? Normally you should have a pulmonary artery acceleration time of greater than 90 milliseconds, but if it's less than 60, right? This is concerning, right? There's some, some obstruction that's causing kind of this compressed column of blood. So I can rapidly get up to that velocity versus somewhere where I have this slow onset to that velocity. So I'm gonna leave it there, but that's pulmonary acceleration time. The last thing that I wanted to talk about before we wrap things up and we're getting near the end, I know it's been a lot of physics, uh, is talking about the velocity time integral, right? And this is really going to become important, particularly with some lectures that we want to have kind of coming up here with Ashish talking about some cardiac um, function. But basically, what we want to be able to do is calculate columns of blood, right? Because we talk about in cardiology, right, we talk about things like the cardiac output, how much volume of blood can the heart pump at any given, you know, period of time, right? Um, and these are these are helpful information. Again, I don't have a vital sign around that. Um, but we have these standards like cardiac output is, you know, what, five liters per minute, five to eight liters per minute. And if you have, you know, some shock state, you're going to have a lower cardiac output. And if you have, 
you know, some hyper dynamic state, maybe it's a little higher. And so to be able to calculate what your cardiac output is going to be helpful, but you know, without being able to put like a flow meter inside the vessel and do something invasively, you know, how do we do this? Right. And this is where the velocity time integral comes into play, right? It gives us an idea uh, of volumes of blood that are ejected. Right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this, um, this volt, this, Doppler packet, you know, from multiple beats. And if you trace the outline, right, the machine does it for you, you can trace the outline and get kind of the, the curve, uh, or a mathematical curve that is created in this outline, right. Uh, and then we can use a little bit of fancy math, right, we can use a little bit of calculus to then find the area under the curve, right. So remember back from, you know, basically your calc class, or your math classes, if you're given this sample shape, right? And you want to know what is the area of this shape, right? And you have a formula of, you know, whatever this formula is. And it's been a while from since I've done trig to be able to remember how to get exactly this formula. Uh, but you know, you can you can create a formula, whatever it is, right? And then put that formula into your integral calculation and say, I want to evaluate it from x minus one to x plus one, which is kind of what I gave here. And that will give you, they'll, they'll turn that formula into an area. So the area of that blue space is going to be, you know, N, you know, whatever the units are, you know, squared. So centimeters squared, right? That's going to be the area underneath this curve, right? So we can then convert that area to volume by multiplying it by the, the base, right? So if we go back to a little bit of calculus here, right? We have our graph right? And we have this arc, right? So we're going to do the integral from zero to one, right? This is zero, zero, and this is one of that formula. Um, what did I say? It was, you know, F the function, you know, whatever that formula is equals that area to turn that into a volume. You're going to multiply the area times assuming it's like a spherical thing, right? Finding that thing here like that, whatever, this, um, you know, this base is going to be right. We're going to multiply it by that. Um, and that's going to give us the volume, um, of this, this cone, right. Um, so we can use that in, to our favor. When we go back to, um, go back to here, we can find the area of this, you know, the area under the curve, right. And then we can multiply that times the, the, the area of the, basically the base pi r squared um so what we're going to do here we're going to measure this and it's going to give us this vti you know vti of some number uh and we take essentially our let's say our aortic outflow area right so we have our aortic valve we can measure this diameter the aortic outflow track diameter um uh, the, so it's going to call the lvot diameter right so divided by two times um well, square that times pi gives us that, right? And then we multiply that by the VTI going through there. And that should give us the volume of blood that's transmitted through that vessel uh, over a period of time, right? Or in that one beat. And we can multiply beats per minute and then we get our, our cardiac output. So it's a really helpful way of basically saying, what is, how can I convert this? Doppler image into a volume calculation to get our cardiac output, you know, through this particular area. And so what you'll notice uh, is that in, an, in a normal patient, this calculation, this diameter, the LVOT diameter is going to be relatively fixed, definitely from beat to beat. Now, if you measure it from, you know, now and 20 years from now, it may be different, but from beat to beat, right, that's going to be relatively fixed. So when you plug this into the calculation, VTI times your LVOT diameter calculation, right? Um, you're basically going to have this be constant. So your VTI is roughly equal to the volume of blood that's ejected, you know, per, per, uh, per beat. Now the units are going to obviously be different because we have to account for that cofactor. But what we can do is we can say, if your VTI goes up, then our stroke volume goes up. If our VTI goes down, then our stroke volume goes down, right? Uh, so it's a very helpful way of basically assessing this cardiac output, you can say it in cardiac index, uh, or the function that this, this, um, 
vessel is going to have um, or this heart's going to have as it's pumping blood, right? So that's basically our overview of the um, of, of advanced spectral Doppler, right? We learned a lot of things today. We talked a little bit about kind of how spectral Doppler works. We talked a little bit about what the packet is, kind of how to understand that packet in context of traffic. And then we looked at a couple different ways that we're going to you know, assess this different, uh, these different packets and things that they can be helpful in a clinical context. And so hopefully, um, well, hopefully, number one, it was helpful. But number two, hopefully, this can bring us uh, to the place where we can start using this information uh, and talking about this information in future lectures and give us a baseline understanding kind of as we evaluate, you know, the heart and from a little bit more of an advanced perspective. So with that being said, I'm going to conclude things here. Um, are there any questions that you guys have uh, about this material, you know, or, or related material um, for, for Doppler ultrasound? Uh, 